Well, hello, friends, and we certainly do hope that you're enjoying the study that we're going through and the sessions that it presents to all of us. Now, we know that over time, questions may come up, observations, and or even statements that you would like to share with us, and we wanted to introduce to you a means by which you can make contact with us, and that is through email at billw at cgi.org. That's billw at cgi.org. We would love to hear from you to help us out as well, because so often, you know, we get into a mindset perhaps and are not aware necessarily of things that are crossing your mind as a result of the material that we may be covering. So don't be shy, don't be bashful, don't hesitate if indeed a question may emerge through the presentations that we share with you and go ahead and just email us at this billw at cgi.org email address and we will get them and hopefully over the ensuing weeks be able to address some of them, even perhaps subjects that you would like to see us address, we'd be more than happy to take some of those ideas and maybe build presentations around them. So one more time, Bill W at CGI.org if you have any questions or statements or observations to make, and we'll look forward to receiving those requests from you. So in the meantime, let's now get back to the study that we're going through. You know, it's been said in the past by some that, well, we've been born in the middle of a story. A movie, if you will. A story in a movie of God's history. His story, if you know what I'm talking about. A story of man's destiny and what God is doing in order to bring many sons unto glory. And it's a story that's been filled with pain and suffering. Many of us who have studied over the years, if we have taken the time to become somewhat acquainted with history, are well aware of the fact that history includes a lot of stories about war and agony, injustices and greed, filth and lust and power, intrigue, politics and government, a story that deals with so many, many details in how God has raised up empires and pushed peoples from one end of the earth to the other, only to allow empires to rise and again once more allow them to be cut down and be replaced with other peoples and other empires, all for the purpose of what? You know and I know, brethren, to bring his ultimate objective to pass, and that is to ultimately fulfill the destiny of humankind, which is to result in man's birthing process a birthing process that will ultimately result in the awarding of a spirit body in the world tomorrow. It's a great story. It's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for all of humankind once humankind begins to appreciate and understand what it's all about on what God is doing in order to bring many sons unto glory, how he is providing access to eternal life and how he will bring spirit beings to this planet, awarding them with wisdom and knowledge to be able to judge the nations. And it's something that's in your Bible, this story that is, from Genesis to Revelation on how he's doing that. And part of the program on the method by which he is doing it, my brethren, is through his ecclesia. Now, ecclesia is nothing more than a Greek word that means assembly. It means called out ones. It means group. Has been, as a matter of fact, translated in the English to the word church. However, through the remaining part or portion of this presentation, I would like to stay away from the word church on purpose because, well, people get a little buggy-eyed about that word and sometimes get confused on just what that word really means. They, and what I'm talking about is oftentimes they, they misunderstand the scope of the word church and they get a little bit kind of miscued about the connotations of what that word means and esoteric and kind of abstract and ambiguous because the word has been so misconstrued over the years to where people begin to think that well a church organization is what defines the organism and hence begin to think that well their organization is the only denomination or organization there is and it and of and by itself 
represents and or defines the total organism, the church at large, the ecclesia, and that's not true. So for all intents and purposes today, I would like to just talk about God's assembly at large, the called out ones by God, those who are abiding by the testimony of Jesus Christ and keeping the commandments of God. And you know, the truth concerning God's assembly in many respects is stranger than fiction. In studying some of the truth concerning God's called out ones, brethren, it doesn't take long before one begins to recognize that there was a conspiracy, a cover-up, an apostasy, which is again another Greek word that means falling away, a falling away from something that the church was at a location in terms of truth, understanding, comprehension of what God wanted to impart as that way, later to be known as the Christian way, because they were called Christians ultimately, followers of Christ, and by the way that term, that label was not really one that you wanted to be labeled with during the early years of the church. As a matter of fact, it was a word that was used to connotate a rather negative overture of individuals who were associated with that label. Nevertheless, your Bible alludes to the fact that there was already not very few years past when Jesus went right back up to the Father. It wasn't a few years later that there was already signs of something that is a movement, a falling away, a apostasy that was occurring amongst the congregations throughout that early church era. Over here in Second Thessalonians, I'd like to point something out here because the Apostle Paul begins to point these things out that I'm talking to and of which the Bible is quite clear was already this early church already having trouble. Here in Second Thessalonians and in chapter 2 we read here and we pick up the context in verse 3 and Paul states, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And this whole section here comes from the word apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now keep in mind, Paul was living during the times of the Roman Empire. And it was very easy for them to understand and see that, especially since the Caesars thought they were gods to begin with, that he, Caesar, ultimately would perhaps move over into the Jerusalem area, set himself up in the existing temple, of which was, in fact, existing at that time, and begin to claim himself uh, God. Here, as Paul points out in verse 4, he again alludes to this very thing. Verse 4, and I quote, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And again, I remind you, keep in mind, the temple was existing at this time, and certainly it was a natural for Paul to kind of gravitate toward that understanding and concept of which he took from words of Jesus and reports from Luke and Mark and Matthew and John, the very prophecies pointing to end time events and conditions that would be fulfilled along these lines, my friends and brethren. But here, nevertheless, we see here, as Paul continues in verse 7, he states a very interesting observation. And here it is. For a mystery of iniquity, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. This is Second Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Only he now lets will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they may or might be saved. So here Paul states that an end time scenario was going to occur, and it was going to befall on those individuals who had lost a love for the truth. Here, as you continue on in this story, Again, Paul, addressing a young evangelist, Timothy, states here in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaks expressingly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits 
and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And brethren, you know and I know, we are in fact in these latter days. Here in First Timothy, we read in verse 18, This charge I commit unto you, son Timothy, Paul again writing to this young evangelist, 1 Timothy in verse 18, according to the prophecies which went before on you that you by them might war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blasphemy. So here are two individuals, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who Paul claims have shipwrecked their own faith by giving credence to seducing doctrines that Paul had warned Timothy about, as well as talked to those in Thessalonica about those very things as well. Here in 2 Timothy, let's go over here, uh, brethren, to 2 Timothy and in chapter 2, and in verse 15 again, along the same lines, Paul states and again makes a recommendation to this young evangelist Timothy, stating, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as does a canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth, have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So here Paul's already pointing out that there are individuals, Hymenaeus again, Alexander being another one, and now we had a third one, Philetus, who are claiming certain things of which Paul states are not true and in fact are deceiving people. So here we see the early church was already having its problems to begin with not so many years after Jesus had already ascended back to the Father. Chapter 4, second book, Timothy, same book here, same individual, Paul writing to this young evangelist, states here in chapter 4, at breaking into the context, verse 3 now, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itchy ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. We can begin to see here that the Apostle Paul was in fact very concerned about things that were already beginning to be noticed. In the book of Peter, the Apostle here, in Second Peter states in chapter 2 and in verse 1, as well, here Peter also, having again the same concerns, makes mention here in chapter 2, Second Peter, verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, that is pretentious words, they will be false words, pretending basically is what it is alluding to, make merchandise of you. And oh, do we have, don't we, brethren? You know and I know we have merchandising going on in what is considered the Christian community today. We would be fools not to admit to the fact that every time you turn on Sunday morning television, be it on the religious broadcasting stations or for that matter, even some of the bigger networks who allow religious programs to be broadcasted on their stations, you see upon preacher upon preacher upon preacher asking for people to send them money for this tape, that tape, this booklet, that booklet, get this trinket or that trinket for this or that or for just so many, 25 bucks, 35 bucks, we'll put your name on this brick of the building that we're building or we'll dedicate this piece of slate to your family and on and on I could go and you know what we're talking about here and I don't even think even Peter had in his own mind the concept or scope and magnitude of what today we see manifested in the Christian community but boy we see it and the merchandising continues to go on as Peter well prophesied right here in verse 3 chapter 2 2nd Peter and I continue whose judgment 
now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. Over here in the book of Acts, again, along the same theme, I just want to bring this attention to all of us to make us realize that that early church, the early church and the early apostles, be they Paul, Peter, Jude, you name them, even the apostle John who claimed that the spirit of the Antichrist was already doing well even in amongst his time. Here Paul in the city of Ephesus in the book of Acts in chapter 20 and in verse 28 he warns these leaders, these local individuals who were there at the church or in the city of Ephesus and represented the congregation there in that city of Ephesus. Verse 28, book of uh, Acts chapter 20 we read, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, Paul states, verse 29, that after my departing, and Paul was getting ready to leave, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, why? To draw away disciples after them. Amazing. Amazing, brethren, to see this as early as just a few decades after Jesus ascended back to the Father, we find the early church already being and experiencing certain departing of the ways by individuals, so much so that the apostles, many of the prominent apostles of that day, Paul and Peter included, as well as John and many others, warning making observations, writing in the books here that have become the New Testament record of that church event known as the Ecclesia, the called out ones, and what they were already experiencing in terms of a falling away. And here we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, again, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul again stating some things of why of why these events are occurring. And he doesn't mince words, brethren. Here he points out and warns all of us in verse 1, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, and here's my point, listen to this, listen to what Paul states here, verse 4, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ unto uh, Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Over here, Second Corinthians, and in uh, chapter 11, we find here again the same situation in regards to the Apostle Paul warning people about the events that were going on that were causing certain conditions of the church to be taken away. And he states here in verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, in other words, don't be surprised, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. We read just in a few chapters before, Paul states the God of this world, and meaning here Satan the devil, and here once again reaffirming the fact that it is no surprise then that because Satan is the God of this world, that even his own ministers would be transformed, here verse 15, 2 Corinthians 11, as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. So here we find that 
as many of us can begin to see and understand that there was in fact as early as I say a few decades after Jesus Christ ascended back to the Father a conspiracy a cover-up a diversion tactic already occurring and being exercised initiated by the very God of this world and of which resulted in as we come down now down through the many years that we've come down into a great worldwide deception brethren look don't forget this scripture I mean it is in your Bible and I like to use it once in a while just if nothing else to remind all of us to understand the fact that the reality we're dealing with whether we like it or not is a reality that all of us must understand to accept that there is a great deception going on that is geared toward preventing you from properly understanding what God is doing and what the destiny of humankind is and what God intends for man's destiny to be here in Revelation 12 this is where I, I, I want to bring your attention to help you understand and realize there is a cover-up to prevent you from the proper understanding of God from the proper understanding of his objectives concerning mankind and we read it right here in verse 9 of chapter 12 out of the book of Revelation and it states the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceives you hear what I'm saying now which deceives who Satan that old dragon the devil which deceives half the world a part of the world your neighborhood brethren look what it says Revelation 12 verse 9 which deceives the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him and you know and I know brethren he is confined here chained unto eternal damnation that later on will be awarded to him as Jesus Christ comes back to reclaim this planet and to give him his rightful rightful punishment and we can read about that in Revelation chapter 20 of which will later on come to be but the point that I want to make in all of this is that the world is in the grips brethren of a globe girdling apostasy that is purpose to camouflage and confuse God's objectives concerning you and me and the rest of humanity and it's been done via a very very clever counterfeit predicated on giving the people frankly what they want a religion that has been for millennia based on nature and sex and at the same time geared to distract and decoy the understanding of the real truths that God has for all of us as human beings to understand concerning what his nature is concerning what he has in store for us concerning what his whole plan consists of no there has been a very clever counterfeit that has been purposed to camouflage much of what God has intended for humankind and unfortunately it has resulted in the vast majority of human beings to be deceived and there's a rightful purpose don't get me wrong God has it in control God's not losing any battles and you know that as well as I do that there is purpose in this plan it's his story brethren and we need to allow God to work his plan and praise God that you and I are have begun to understand a little bit a little bit of what that plan involves look here in the book of Jude for a moment because I want to bring again to your attention even the Apostle Jude who was concerned about observations that he saw that generated a statement a writing here that is quite passionate in an appeal and a plea of those individuals who would read this letter to consider something and look what he's asking verse 3 here beloved when I gave all diligence to write unto you he says verse 3 now book of Jude it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly and that means struggle it means to painstakingly strive to struggle to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the Saints over here in verse 19 same book book of Jude there be they who separate themselves sensual having not the spirit 
Yes, in verse 18 he says, How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. Brethren, even the Apostle Jude, and as I pointed out, Peter, and over here in Second John, verse 7, he says, Many deceivers... Verse 7, 2 John, are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. There are brethren, there are people among us who claim to be Christian in the traditional Christian community today who claim that Jesus Christ never died that he never was dead, that when he was in the grave as they would say for a day and a half instead of three days and three nights he was preaching to spirits in Tartaru in hell and they claim hell where there are human beings in some macabre state of eternal torment that God allows and supports and sustains for the very purpose of torturing human beings for all eternity which is a macabre thought from the start. But nevertheless, the fact remains is that here the apostle states that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, there are people who believe that Christ did not come in the flesh, that he was some kind of a spirit and he never died. The fact is your Bible says, brethren, he took on the seed. He took on the seed of Abraham and he died and was in the grave three days and three nights. And that, in fact, is the sign, the validation, the legitimization of his very messiahship. And yet today we have a religious community, a vast majority of so-called Christian folk, who claim that he never died. Hence, if he never died, then he was never in the flesh, that he was some kind of an immortal soul contained in some kind of a container we call flesh and blood and sinew. And when his flesh, he body died, he wasn't dead. His spirit moved on into this place called Tartarus to preach to demons in this place called hell. Poppycock, you know it as well as I do, brethren, Jesus Christ was dead. And he died for you and for me so that we could have eternal life. Unfortunately, though, people think in God, about God, throughout the Christian community, that, well, the church was to become some kind of a big and powerful political enforcer of government, a policeman of the people, teaching and preaching all kinds of insidious teachings, things, as I've already pointed out, that like a place called hell, where, as I've already said, this place, this area of of spirits that are forever tormenting human beings who wouldn't abide by God or pay enough money to the church to provide more pews for a building that didn't need to be built but because some religious organization wanted to build, be built they decided to put upon the people guilt trips to extrapolate all kinds of money and those who didn't give it were assigned to hell you know it, it's it's ridiculous Jesus Christ was born on Christmas, a winter solstice celebration, which is nothing more than that, a pagan solstice celebrated date of which was stamped Christian. Resurrection, a day and a half, I've already alluded to that, when in fact your Bible says three days and three nights. The Sabbath being changed to Sunday, or the commandments no longer are needed to be obeyed. This is the age of grace. Once saved, always saved. Therefore, Christians who sin, well, they can never sin because Christians can't sin because once you're saved, you're always saved. The holy days have been done away with. I mean, these are teachings, brethren, you know and I know, that have come and are now part and parcel to the Christian community concerning the way that most people view Christianity and the teachings, that God's a trinity, that his church is one big organization with some kind of very large hierarchical leadership structure, that his assembly, that is the church organization, is in fact God's government, and that you can eat anything you want. Why, you can eat dogs, and you can eat cats, and you can, you can eat rats and mice, and Frankly, if as long as you obey God and have faith and, and do the things that, well, God wants you to do, your reward is going to be a place called heaven, 
where forever you're going to sit on some kind of a cloud, I guess, and eat angel food cake, be fanned by angels while you're relaxing and lounging on a cloud, forever taking in the beatific vision of God for all eternity. And I could, brethren, I could go on and on and on, and you know what I'm talking about, but unfortunately, the reality is it's horrendously, horrendously sad that God's church, the true church, has been silhouetted, has been almost dominated and pushed back into the backdrop by comparison to the prominence of this globe-girdling apostasy that has taken on different formations over the centuries and has served the purpose of deceiving the masses into thinking things about Jesus Christ and about God the Father, about the reward of the saved, about the punishment of the wicked, about where and what your destiny is, about the nature of God, and about all the things that I've already alluded to, of which are all misdirected. It's a shame, but then again, that's mankind. Man is a very materialistic being, and we like to see the things that we worship. We like to feel the things that we worship. We like to smell the things that we worship. We are a materialistically minded being, and we live in a materialistic dimension. And so hence, oftentimes, we ourselves as a culture of human beings get caught up in the worship of things. And as history has proved, and as we ourselves, if we want to take the time to really study into where many of our traditions and many of our customs come from, we will find that they go all the way back to nature and sex, to an individual located in your Bible. I'm not going to turn there, but I will reference chapter 10 of the book of Genesis to an individual, um, one who was claimed to be named Nimrod, a great hunter against God, who was responsible, responsible for building many walled cities and essentially was the father of the Babylonian religious worship, sun-worshipping Babylonian nature, sex-worshipping system. Solstice, equinox worshiping, the assignment of nature, and the worshiping of the creation more than the creator. Much of it, brethren, you know as well as I do, can be traced right back to him. But over in the book of Romans, and I think the Apostle Paul best summarizes it, and I'd like to go over to the book of Romans, chapter 1, where Paul says essentially and makes a statement here, an observation concerning human nature at its best concerning religious worship and he states here in verse 18 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness this is Romans 1 now verse 19 because that which may be known of God is manifested in them for God has showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What he's saying here, what the apostle is saying is, you want to understand the spirit world, look around and see the physical world. You will not only see God in the spirit world in the physical dimension of the things that surround you in your three-dimensional world of your five senses, but you will also be able to understand the very nature of God. So hence, humankind is truly without excuse. Unfortunately, however, our choices as a creation have been contrary to what God wanted us to understand. Notice here how the apostle states that in verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creepy things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature or the creation more than the creator who is blessed forever 
Amen. Paul making a very profound observation here, brethren, in regards to the spirit world and how we as human beings ought to be worshiping God. Even Jesus himself said that we should be worshiping God in spirit. You read in the Old Testament that God, when he spoke to Israel, made a made a what you could say concerted effort not to show them any image so that they were without excuse if in fact they would make an image god did not want him to be characterized be it in the face of a bull or a lion or a calf or a mosquito or a fly i mean there are so many creatures that have been over the millennia created and molded into icons and statues and images from all kinds of cultures throughout the history of humankind that have been used in man's attempt to help them worship God because somehow man always feels a little bit better if he can see what he's worshiping. So what do we do? We, we create the Madonna and the baby. We create statues of Jesus with long hair and a beard. We place a body on a cross and place it up over an altar and claim that that's a religious symbol. In my mind, when you look at it, a dead body nailed to a couple of pieces of stick, I mean, that's macabre. It is gross. It is sickening. It's almost like a Stephen King uh, movie, if you will, uh, with that kind of a scene, walking into a church building and looking at something like like that with a heart. I, I, I remember a statue one time I saw in a Catholic church of a heart and there it was. It was a bleeding heart with a cross stabbed right in it and there was a crack in it and blood was coming out of the heart. I mean, ghastly, you know. I mean, it's, a, it's like a horror movie when you, when you think about these things. Yet, nevertheless, these are part and parcel to the accoutrements of so much of what today we call Christian worship. And it blows your mind in some cases when you begin to try and understand where, where did all these things come from? Why in the world are we so fixated on some of these ritualistic images and icons? And yet, nevertheless, we are. And it's unfortunate because what Nimrod developed what the Babylonian system passed on down to the Medes and the Persians who passed it down to the Greco-Macedonians who passed it down to the Greco-Romanish governments and religio systems of their day and age was nothing more than an idolatrous system of worshiping the creation more than the creator, focusing around golden calves and candles and fires and phallic symbols and fish and trees and the goddesses of fertility regarding eggs and rabbits and obelisks. I mean, you could go on and on regarding these particular things. This is why, in many cases, you know it and I know it, brethren, that God told the Israelites when they went into some of these lands that they would cut down these obelisks which were nothing more than sex symbols of which the people would worship because they felt that that's where life came from. And you can read about these things in the book of Judges and in the Old Testament and other areas where the Israelites were commanded essentially to go ahead and tear down these things, these obelisks, because these were insulting to God. God detested them. It repulsed him of these things because he doesn't find in any way, shape, or form satisfaction in these particular images. As a matter of fact, God was quite clear to the Israelites that he didn't even find satisfaction in some cases of their own, their own sacrifices, but that's another story. But nevertheless, and what I'm driving at in so many cases here, brethren, is that God's church, when it came on the scene and it began to take to task some of the things that were going on at the time, even in some cases the Gentile manufacturers of statues who were very upset in the book of Acts, you can read about them when they were upset over the fact that these Christians who were turning the world upside down, criticizing in some cases statue and idolatrous worship, were actually causing some of their business ventures of statue making to go down the tubes. People weren't buying them as much and they were fearful that their business would be affected in the negative sense and began to persecute even those Christians. As a matter of fact, the story of Stephen and his martyrdom I think best summarizes and captures much of the tension 
that was going on at the time and personifies a lot of the conflict in which this movement called Christianity coming onto the scene at that time had to face and contend with in taking to task the current conditions of religious worship that it found itself surrounded by. Over here in 1 Peter, I want to turn there for a moment, 1 Peter and in chapter 4 and in verse 1, because Jesus prophesied that this way of life was not going to be an easy way of life. As a matter of fact, he said in the Gospels that he did not come to bring peace on earth. He came to bring a sword. He came to divide families. He came to essentially turn the world upside down and that he would suffer persecution. And those who would follow him would also suffer persecution. Now let's notice right here in 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse 1. We're told here, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So what the apostle here is stating is that if you are going to attempt to take on this burden... And it is a burden to live the Christian life. It's not for sissies, brethren. You know that as well as I do. And here what Peter is saying is, is that you better prepare yourself with the same mind that Christ had. Because guess what? You will suffer if, in fact, you take on the battle and fight the battle of the flesh. And not to mention, in addition, over here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we are told, and I'm just going to break into the context here in verse 12, where Paul, telling Timothy, this young evangelist again, he says, Yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So here it is, Paul telling Timothy, Hey, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, if you're going to attempt to live godly in this way of life, ultimately it is going to lead to persecution and suffering. In the book of Daniel, chapter 11, in one of the prophecies of the latter days, the book of Daniel, chapter 11, we read here, way back in verse 33, verse 33, we read, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, by spoil, many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them, to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Persecution. Read Hebrews 11. God's people have suffered persecution down through the ages. Now notice what I'm talking about here, brethren. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts over here, Acts chapter 4. Because persecution erupted. I mean, it erupted almost immediately because of the passion that occurred from those who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who knew the principles and the tenets and the teachings of Christ and those things of which he stood for, the values and the standards and the excitement associated with all of the events that surrounded the whole life of Christ and the crucifixion and the death and the resurrection. I mean, these people were on fire. And as a result of that, passion, they were speaking it publicly and taking all kinds of grief for it. Look here in chapter 4. And as they spoke unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was not even tied. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. So here was a group of individuals that were arrested as a result of preaching Jesus Christ and the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't agree about the resurrection. As a matter of fact, they didn't believe in any kind 
kind of a resurrection. Consequently, that's why they were sad, you see. Bad joke, I realize that, brother. Nevertheless, in chapter 6, we have even more, even more of the same story here in regards to certain synagogues, whole synagogues of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen, verse 9, chapter 6, book of Acts, verse 10 now, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke, that of Stephen. Verse 11 now, chapter 6, book of Acts. Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. And we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy the place and, dis and change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Here Stephen being given a forum for a witness as a result of his preaching being taken to task in a public court, a public hearing, and to be told that what he was saying needed to be stopped. Otherwise, and as many of you are well aware as you read through chapter 7, resulting in his death. And it did. You can read in verse 60 there where Stephen kneels down, cites and, and cries with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin on their charge. And when he had said this, he was dead. He fell asleep. An amazing story. Nevertheless, illustrative of persecution and more persecution. Turn with me for a moment here again to the book of Acts and in chapter 8. Here in the book of chapter 8, we read a very interesting story and a very interesting observation that Luke writing in the book of Acts or writing the book of Acts makes here and he says here Saul who later on became Paul as many of us are well aware of was consenting even unto his death that is talking about Stephen at that time there was great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all they those Christians were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria Look at this, except the apostles. The brethren were scattered abroad, but not the apostles. The apostles, they hunkered down and they stayed in Jerusalem. Now, devout men carried Stephen to his burial, made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, later on he became Paul, but nevertheless for the time being, Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. He hauled them off, families, split them up, incarcerated them. And in, for all intents and purposes, as many of us have come to understand, some of those people even being used as entertainment fodder in the great Colosseums of that time there in Rome later on. But nevertheless, verse 4, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad, now who were they? Again, it was the brethren. They were the ones scattered abroad. Where were the apostles? They were hunkered down over there in Jerusalem. Therefore, verse 4 now, they were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. And then you can read about Philip and so on. But the point that I want to make, brethren, is that there was persecution. It didn't stop. here, Over here in Acts chapter 12, book of Acts, again, chapter 12, we read now about the time Herod the king, verse 1, stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he hailed, oh, I'm sorry, and he killed, he killed James, that is one of the Zebedee brothers, the brother of John, with a sword. He killed, he killed James the brother of John with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to take Peter. And then were the days of unleavened bread. When he had apprehended him, he put him into prison, delivered him into the four quad quadrants of uh, soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter, and that's the only place the word Easter shows up in your whole Bible and really is a mistranslation. It's, it should be Pascha or Passover to bring him forth to the people because you just heard you know, there in verse 3 about the days of unleavened bread. Passover or Pascha was always associated with the days of unleavened bread. In many cases, the days of unleavened bread were considered eight days as opposed to the seven days of unleavened bread, which you can read about, of course, in Leviticus chapter 23. But nevertheless, what I'm trying to say here, brethren, 
is the fact remains God's church was persecuted for saying the things that it said, preaching the things that it preached, and teaching the things that it taught because it was not a well-accepted understanding of the way people were to think of God. It was totally different. It was contrary at that time, even though it was viewed as an extension of Judaism, and it was. It was an extension. It was viewed as an extension of Judaism. Nevertheless, the fact remains, and the reality is, is people didn't take to it too kindly because very simply it was, in essence, a catalyst that triggered persecution because of the animosity and threats that certain people felt as a result of this new way. And everybody was feeling it. I mean, it was Gentiles, Hellenistic Jews. There were the Greeks and the Syrians, the Italians and the Gauls, the Samaritans, all of these people, descendants from Babylon, did not like, in many respects, what was going on in this regard. And so the apostles went all over, and they preached to these people that I just mentioned as well, because some of these individuals did lock in to this new way and some did find it very very inspiring and life-changing and there were many who were baptized and over the years were ultimately converted and were the ones who started small congregations like little mushrooms and bits of popcorn here and there scattered throughout Asia Minor and finally ultimately expanding throughout Europe and up into the the northern mountain ranges of Italy and the Piedmont valleys of France and later on spreading over into England and and other areas of the of the Netherland areas and ultimately even to the new world but as your bible says and in Acts chapter 2, that was the intent. The intent of the gospel to be preached worldwide was stated right back here in chapter 2 and in verse 9. I'm sorry, chapter 1 and in verse 8, where it says, You shall receive power, Jesus said this now right before his ascension, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And hence God's church, though never intended to be a strong, political, tightly structured governmental organization, but a small, scattered flock throughout the world of which the grave would never prevail, meaning there would always be certain ones that would be alive on the earth and of which would in fact be the ones preaching the gospel, the true testimony of Jesus Christ and preaching the commandments of God would still exist throughout time. From the time Jesus established it, his called out ones, commissioned with preaching the gospel throughout the world, would be doing just that. However, not easily. The story of God's church, brethren, is a sad story of pain and suffering, and hundreds and if not thousands who were killed and tormented and persecuted and martyred over the years. It's a story of intrigue a story of politics, a story of power struggles and adoptions of certain tenets and teachings that were purposely used in order to camouflage certain truths of which then were passed on down through the generations as Christian in hopes that those generations upon generations upon generations as they, those individuals, would teach their children's children's children would just continue to adopt these pagan rites of which were passed down from Babylon to the Medes to the Greco-Macedonians and the Greco-Romans and onward even into and unto our modern day and age, even into our own social culture. I'd like to read from a book called The Drama of the Lost Disciples by George Jowett. And over here on page 31, he writes 
something that I thought I would share with you here. And I'm quoting now from this book called The Drama of the Lost Disciples. According to Acts 8, 1 through 4, in A.D. 36, the church of Jerusalem was scattered abroad. Even the apostles were forced later to flee, and they did flee later on. We can even find Peter writing his uh, epistles from the area of ancient Babylon, probably over there located in Iran. Nevertheless, I continue here now and quote from page 31 of this book called The Drama of the Lost Disciples. Quote now, ponder the facts. Christ's mission lasted but three years and a half, roughly. Four years later, the elect had fled into exile. The Great Crusade was ended in but six years. True, some disciples labored later there in Judea, but the effects were transitory. Roman rule tightened down with a nailed fist on both Jew and Christian. Within 35 years, the holy city was to be a rubble of ruins and thereafter largely occupied by the heathen and the unbelievers. And I inject here commentary regarding the fact of Titus who rolled into Jerusalem in 70 AD and leveled the temple. Now back to the book here and quote, Christianity had its birth in Christ in the Holy Land, but not its growth that flourished to convert the world. This sprang to its full glory in another land. And how could this happen? And well, how did it happen? But by virtue of God's Holy Spirit and his own guidance. However, in the meantime, persecution continued to drive God's church and the confusion and compromise that occurred amongst the people of Rome and those early church converts became more complex and ultimately whittled down the numbers to the point where in many cases as the emperor Constantine also recognized Christianity as the state religion began to push the true Christians further and further and further into the backdrop. Let me read you again something here from Haley's Bible Handbook on page 760 under the subtitle, The Paganization of the Church. And I quote, Emperor Theodosius in 178 through 198. Now this was before Constantine who really certified and legitimized Christianity and and for all intents and purposes is is labeled the one who truly adopted Christianity as the Roman Holy Roman Empire's Roman Catholic universal that is church. But prior to that as the stage began to st set Emperor Theodosius in 178, and remember Constantine, he didn't come along until 325 A.D., but nevertheless, and I'm back here now quoting from Haley's book, made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire and made church membership compulsory. This was the worst calamity that has ever befallen the church. This forced conversion filled the church with unregenerate people. I continue to quote, Christ had designated to the conqueror, that is, Christ had designated to conquer by purely spiritual and moral means. Up to this time, conversion was voluntary and genuine change in the heart and life. But now, the military spirit of imperial Rome had entered the church. The church had conquered the Roman Empire, but in reality, the Roman Empire had conquered the church by making the church over into the image of the Roman Empire. The church had changed its nature, had entered its great apostasy, had become a political organization in the spirit and pattern of imperial Rome and took its nosedive into the millennium of papal abominations. The imperial church of the 4th and 5th centuries, that's during the time of Constantine, by the way. Now back to quote here. The imperial church of the 4th and 5th centuries had become an entirely different institution from the persecuted church of the first three centuries. In its ambition to rule, it lost and forgot the spirit of Christ. Worship, at first, was very simple, was developed into elaborate, stately, imposing ceremonies, having all the outward splendor that had belonged to the heathen temples. Conversions of the barbarians and the Goths and the Vandals and the Huns who overthrew the Roman Empire accepted Christianity, 
but to a large event their conversion was nominal and their and this just further filled the church with pagan practices and so it went Christianity became adopted in 325 AD pretty much officially by Constantine, the emperor quasi-pope of that time, who allegedly saw a sign in heaven, the sign of a cross, which stated to him, he heard a voice, saying to go and conquer in this sign. And from that point on, he became a quite a what you could say proponent of this way called Christianity and in trying to make it more appealing to the masses of Rome chose to adopt many of the pagan rites of which Roman the Roman people the population of Rome were already used to and just stamped Christianity on it and of which now over the last 1900 years has been just continuing to pick up steam and has remained active. And as may, many of you perhaps, as, and as hard as it may be to believe, but many of you accept and understand, has been an apostasy ongoing in progress. And so for the last 1900 years, as I said, this apostasy has been active. And today, what do we have? We have over a thousand different denominations, all claiming to be Christian, with all different types of factions, attesting to this, that, and the other thing, being different here, different there. We call them denominations. We have Baptist, Pentecostals, Presbyterians. We have all kinds, Catholics included, the Orthodox of this and that and the other thing. My point is, in all of this, is that this stands as verification and confirmation, brethren, that there is a great apostasy that has happened over the last 2,000 years. And we here now, down the road in this 21st century, are now the, what you could say, recipients of the manifestation of where all of this is beginning to go. And where it continues to go, brethren, is not a very welcomed place for those true Christians. Because ultimately, you see, there is going to be more persecution on God's church. As we go forward, God's church, as it continues to preach and cry aloud and show the people of the world their sins will become more and more known as a not too politically correct group of folks and frankly this world is not going to take too kindly to those of us who continue to preach and exemplify the tenets and standards of Jesus Christ yet that's the reality church history 101 where do we go from here perhaps we'll have church history 102.